Okay, good evening and happy Hanukkah, everyone. It is great to see you all. I see um, new friends and old friends, uh, people from uh, Boston, people I know from New York. Welcome one and all and happy Hanukkah. This is a very heavy time for the Jewish people. But uh, Hanukkah, we believe in miracles. We celebrate redemption. We celebrate the increase in radiance of light to banish darkness may it be so in our time as it was in days of old. Uh, I put in the chat the source sheet that we're going to be using tonight. I'll do it once more for those who just logged on. However, I will be sharing the 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 screen. I have you to my left. So if I turn to my left, I'm looking at your beautiful faces. But in front of me, I have my source sheet. And I would like to um, uh, first uh, give a call out and a mazel tov to my chavrusa for this topic, who is Harel Grossman. He's celebrating his bar mitzvah this Shabbos in uh, Israel. And uh, we studied this topic for his bar mitzvah drasha. And I drew off of our studies and added to it a little bit for uh, our our topic this evening. I wish him a mazel tov and his, his parents uh our own and Iris Grossman Mazeltov to the whole family. I'd like to ask the following question. When do we realize that we have a greater destiny, that we have a sacred purpose in life? Huh. And I'd like to consider reflection points and inflection points. Reflection points meaning when are we invited by circumstance or some higher calling to consider this question and inflection points, when does it foment and trigger, catalyze a, a major change in our life, in the way we appreciate and orient ourselves and in how we set out on, on our goals and, and mission. And I'd like to look at Yosef as a kid, some point. And since tonight is Zod Hanukkah, the eighth night of Hanukkah, I would like to begin with the Gemara in Shabbos that discusses both Hanukkah and the Yosef story, which is the topic of this week's Parsha, Parshas Miketz, and has been the topic of last week's Parsha and will continue to be the topic of the Parsha. It's the single longest narrative in Sefer Breshit, of course, and I start with the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat of Kaf Aleph Amud Bet. Amar Rav Kahana. Rav Kahana said, Darash Rabbi Natan bar Manyumi mishmed Rabbi Tanchom. Rabbi Natan, the son of Manyumi, said in the name of Rabbi Tarchon the following drasha. This is a halachic midrash. Ner shel Chanukah shehi nicha lemala me'esri mama psula kesuka. So the first one is, he doesn't give us a source. I said it was a Midrash halacha. It's just a halacha. That when you place your Hanukkah light, it can't be higher than 30 feet, approximately. 20 amot, 20 cubits. Just like you can't have the schach of a, a sukkah higher than 20 cubits, just like you cannot have the lechi of a, of a maboy uh, the 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 lintel of a maboy to enclose it in Hilko Seirevin higher than 20 amos, 30 feet. So why is that? She'eno sholet bo ayin. Because that's too high for us to take notice of. We can't notice it. If you light a uh, Hanukkah so high in the air, people aren't going to look up. They're not going to see it. And it defeats the whole purpose of Pirsume Nisa, of observing the candlelights, which are supposed to remind us of the miracle of Hanukkah. And then we read, V'amar Rab Kahana, Darash Rabbi Nasan Bar Manyumi Mishem de Rab Tarhum, de Rab Tanhum, excuse me, the same person is invoked for a different teaching. Now, when the oral Torah is redacted and put into into writing, so it's not unreasonable that people's memories are associative. They have a file on all of the drushas of Rabbi Nassim Bar Manyumi in the name of Rabbi Tarku. And now Rabbi Kahana is just calling upon that mental file and relating all of those teachings. And so here's the second one. 
My dichtiv, what is the meaning of that which is, is written in uh, in in uh, the parsha last week's parsha parsha Shvayesha, Vahabor reik ein bo mayim, and the pit was empty. The pit in which the brothers threw Yosef, the pit was empty, ein bo mayim. It had no water. Mimashma shenemar vahabor reik, einu yodash ein bo mayim. Since it says that the pit was empty, don't we know that it had no water? It's empty. Of course it had no water. Ela matal mar. So it's actually being elusive. It's asking us to think more deeply. It's saying, mayim, it didn't have water. My main bow, aval nechashim akravim yeshbo. But it did have snakes and scorpions. But it said it was empty. But it was empty of water, not of other things. That's the Midrash Gada that Rabbi Nasan Barmanyumi in the name of Rabbi Tanchum Darshis. Now, the question is, is are these two teachings, one about the height and placement of the Chanukiah and the second about the pit that was seemingly empty but actually was filled with snakes and scorpions, is there any connection between the two or is it just a... Uh, a, a function of memory, of associative memory, inciting these sources. So I draw to your attention the Meshe Chachma, Rabbi Meir Simcha of Dubinsk. And the Meshe Chachma writes the following. Bahabor reik ein bo mayim, and the pit was empty, it had no water. Haroe makom shena'ase lo nes. If someone sees a place where a miracle happened, mevarech, there is a bracha for that. Baruch Shasali Nes Bamakum Hazeh. Blessed be God, King of the Universe, who made a miracle for me in this place. Haperush Kadivre Abudraham, and the explanation of this is in accordance with the liturgical commentator. He's a rabbi, he's a commentator, not, but he's most famous for his uh, commentaries on lit- liturgy. Davka Shiatza Midera that when do we make this blessing? when there is a seemingly supernatural miracle, not what we would call uh, uh, the natural miracles that are with us, the wonders of everyday living. These are supernatural miracles. And that's the whole reason why we make a blessing on the light of Hanukkah because the miracle of the oil was beyond natural. It was supernatural. And really, the, the big miracle is that we won the war and we had 200 years of autonomy and self-sovereignty. That was the miracle. So why do we make the blessing on the candles? Because the other miracle could be explained naturally, even though, of course, it's Yad Hashem, it's the hand of God. But the Ner Hanukkah is me'al l'teva. It's supernatural. And so the reason why the Chanukah has to be placed within 20 Amos is because if it's supposed to trigger our consciousness to remember that God performed a supernatural miracle that then shapes our understanding of all of the events that transpired, the military victory, the self-sovereignty, that's why it has to be within sighting so we could see it. It has to be less than 20 ammo. The Hinebi Yosef, and in the story of Yosef, Rabbi Tanhuma, this is not Rabbi Tanhum mentioned in the Gemara, but Rabbi Tanhuma, who has his own midrash, maybe it's the same rabbi, the truth is, I don't know. Shebisha'a uh, Shashad Yosef, Mikfuras Aviv, that when at the end of Sefer Breshit, when Yaakov Avinu dies, and Yosef gets permission from Paro to return his body to the Maras of Machpelah and bury him in the land that God promised to his forefathers. When he returned with the body to perform the burial, he passed by the pit which the brothers had thrown him into. Shehetzi bevor, and he peered into the pit, l'shem shamayim nitkaven, and it was a visual reminder of the unfolding 
of his life. It also reminded him, per the Midrash, like the Gemara says, that he escaped a pit filled with scorpions and snakes without harm. And therefore, he made the bracha. As he left, says Rabbi Tanhuma, when he returned to Israel, he made the bracha. Baruch Shasali Nesba Makom Hazeh, blessed be God, sovereign of the universe, who made a miracle for me in this place. And why did he make a miracle on the pit? Because it was a supernatural miracle. He was there with snakes and scorpions. He held their attention. They didn't strike and they didn't bite. Okay. That's a really interesting idea. I want us to think about that for a second. Yosef is the viceroy of Egypt. He saved them during the time of famine, made Paro a mint. Paro basically controls everything. And he provided refuge and salvation for his family. His father, with whom he had a reunion, dies. And he returns to bury him. And he sees the pit that he was thrown into. Now, is that a positive image or a negative image? Is it a traumatic trigger? Or does it evoke some deeper appreciation and understanding? Clearly, if the Midrash Tanhuma says that he makes a bracha, it evoked something deeper. So my question returns. When does Yosef realize that he has a greater role to play, that he was destined for something great. That is the question. If he made the bracha when he returned, certainly he knew by that point. But when did he realize that he had a greater destiny? So some of you may recognize the Latin term, terminus ad quem. It refers to like the end point, the latest point, the point to which we go. Okay, when can we say for certain that Yosef realized he had a role to play, that he had a greater destiny? And I think that we could point to the clearest, most explicit citation of this is not in Parsha Miketz, next week in Parsha Bayigash, when Yosef can no longer contain himself and he breaks down and he cries, and he reveals himself to his brothers. He, he couldn't contain himself. And he called out, Take out all of the people from, from before me. No one stood with him when he revealed himself to his brothers. And he cried, he gave forth his voice in tears. And everyone heard him, all of Egypt and the house of Pharaoh. And Yosef said to his brothers, Ani Yosef, I am Joseph. Is my father yet alive? And his brothers were speechless because they were in shock. Vayomir Yosef alachav, and he says to his brothers, Geshuna Eli, come near. Vayigashu, and they did. Vayomer, ani Yosef achichem, I am your brother Joseph, asher mechartim otin mitzrayma, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. Vata al teyatzvu, vayal yichar be'enechem, do not be sad, do not be mad, ki mechartim oti, for you sold me. Hena ki shalachani Elohim lifnechem. Because for sustenance, shalachani, God has sent me before you. Kizesh time arab for these two years of famine, beker of arts, vote chamesh shanim asher im harish bekatsir. There'll be five more years of famine for a total suddenly. Vayishlacheni Elohim lifnechem. And God sent me before you. Lasum lachem sherit pa'aretz to give a remnant in this land. Lachayot lachem lefle tagadola in order to sustain you, to sustain you. You did not send me here, says Yosef. But rather God did. And he made me a father for Pharaoh, a master of his house, 
Moshel Bechol Eretz Mitzrayim, Eretz Mitzrayim, a ruler over the entire land. So my dear friends, can we agree that at this point, Joseph realizes he has a role to play and he's destined for greatness? I think so. That's why I said that it's the term of sad quem, right? Uh, and later, after Yaakov dies and they come back to Egypt from the funeral and the burial in Egypt, the brothers, if you remember, say to him, hey, you know, dad told us before he died, you shouldn't take revenge against us. And once again, Vayet Yosef B'dabram Elav, he cries. He cries. We could spend the whole hour discussing those tears, those poignant tears, the lack of trust, the residual trauma and dysfunction. Vayomer Aleim Yosef, and Yosef said to him, Al tira'u, do not be afraid. Ki hatachad Elohim ani, am I in place of God? God holds judgments, not me. Vatem chashaptim alei ra'a. Yes, you, you, you thought upon me for bad, for evil. Elohim chashvala tova. But God was really organizing the events. God thought for good. Lamana sakai yom azelach yot amrav. So that we can survive, so that we could thrive, so that we could prosper and populate. Vata al tira'u. And now do not be afraid. And he comforted them. He said, I will sustain you. He spoke to their hearts. So once again, at the end, it is clear, just as in the moment of revelation, it sustains itself. It wasn't a fleeting thought, but it was a sustained realization. That was an inflection point. He has a role. He has a destiny. He not only has a position of greatness, but an agency of greatness. I think we could agree. But the question is, when does Yosef first realize that he's destined for greatness? So what's the terminus ad quo, the earliest point that he could have realized this? So I share with you a, a, a fascinating um, uh, text which uh, comes uh, all the way from Breshit Lamed, uh, Parshat Vayetze, uh, uh, va when, when Yaakov ran away. And he goes, and he makes the deal with Laban for Rachel, and he marries Leah and Rachel, and then they start to have children. Finally, Rachel has a baby, Mazel. Vayishkorel he met Rachel, vayishmai le Elohim, vayitachet rachma. God remembered Rachel, he heard her, and he opened her womb. ben, and she conceived, and she bore a son. Vatomer, and what did she call him? She says, Asaf Elohim et Kherpati, God has gathered my shame. Vatikrach mo Yosef, so she called him Yosef, lay more. Yosef Hashem li ben Achir. God should add for me one more son. And the Meforshim say that everyone kind of knew that he was destined to have 12 sons. So she said, I want one more. I should also contribute at least equal to the wives who used to be Shvachot, to the Zilha and, and Zilpa and Bilha. They gave two. I want to give two. I should have one more. So it's a double name, right? God gathered my shame and God should grant me one more son. Any inkling that Rachel has a sense that this son is destined for greatness. Like when Moshe Rabbeinu is, is born and his mother looks at him and see that he is told that he's good. And the Midrash says that you should hyperlink to Vihine Tov Ma'od or Tov. When God created the world, God saw that it was good. And the room filled with light when Moshe was born because it heralded from birth, that Moshe was destined for greatness. Miriam Hanaviah had prophesied that her brother Moshe would be the redeemer, per the Midrash. Is there any inkling that Rachel has a sense that Moshe is destined, uh, that Yosef is destined for greatness here? So the next Pasuk says, Yosef, And when Rachel gave birth to Yosef, then Yaakov says to Laban, 
Shalcheni, send me, and I will go El Mekomi Ula Ula Arzi to my home, to my place, and to my land. Now, uh, this is interesting. I open this up. Is there any sense that anyone hears here that this is any type of birth scene, nativity scene, that Yosef is destined for greatness from what's said here? Not really. The only curious thing is once Yosef's born, there's an inflection point where Yaakov is ready to confront love and say, time for me to go. Pay up. Where are my wages? But it is interesting, and I don't want to overread this, but I don't want to underread it. It is interesting that the verb that Yaakov uses is shalcheni. Now, I looked at a concredatia, the, the root shin lamed chet is used numerous times throughout Sefer Breshi. That's why I don't want to overread it. But when we go back, what, what did Yosef in his revelation say? Vayishlacheni Elohim lifnechem. God sent me before you. So it has a, a resonance, a reverberation that Yaakov Abinu says, Shalcheni, send me away. It's the, it's the same word. And of course, El Mekomi Ularpsi also reverberates with Abrahamic type of uh, callings of destiny, right? Vayomer Hashem al Abraham lech lecha miarts cham umuladetcha. It's not mim komcha umimuladetcha, but it's miarts cham umuladetcha. And that phrase reverberates throughout Sefer Breshit when Abraham sends his trusty servant Eliezer to to Haran ki el artsi be el muladeti telech, and similarly. When Yaakov makes his deal in Parshat Vayetzi with the Kodesh Baruch Hu, he says, Shuv la'artzacha l'moladetacha, right? Uh, uh, it, it, when, if, if I return to my, my land. So the, these languages, right, are reverberate with the divine promises. So is it possible when Yaakov says to Levan, Shalcheni be'alchal melkomi al'artzi, that Yaakov notices something uh, about Yosef? That doesn't mean Yosef knows something about Yosef. He's just a baby. But what about Yaakov? So I, I couldn't really find any Meforshim who wanted to overread this text in any way, right? The Rashbam says, when Yosef was born, why did Yaakov say it's time to ask? Because his seven years were up. That's when he worked for Rachel. She was barren for seven years since their wedding. That's when he worked, 14 years in total, seven years for, for Rachel. Um, Rab David Svi Hoffman says something beautiful and romantic. He says, Yosef al ha'uva, when his beloved wife, the wife he loved, gave birth. He took it as a divine sign of divine loving kindness. My beloved wife just gave birth to a son, right? I, I I should be out of exile. God's graciousness and kindness, God sending me a message. And Rashi does cite a Midrashic tradition that this is an inflection point because there's this long Midrashic tradition based on the elusive psukim that when Yosef is born, then Yaakov is ready to confront Esau. And Yosef will become the adversary of Esau and kind of shore up Yaakov's ability to defend himself and to survive. So that Midrash tradition is not pshat, but at least it, it, it tries to assign to Yosef some sense that there's a greater destiny here, that something's changing. But again, that may be true, but Yosef himself would not have realized it. Now, I wanted to see between birth as the earliest possible moment of realizing this child is destined for greatness. I already alluded to 
uh, the Midrashic readings of Moshe's birth based on keywords in the Exodus narrative. And the clearest example of when Joseph reveals himself to his brothers and realizes that he has a role to play, is there anything in the middle, any moment in the middle that we might say Yosef has a sense that he is coming into his role and his greatness? So I want to look at other what is known in uh, biblical studies as call narratives. Uh, and and uh, one way of saying it is a call narrative when someone hears their calling in both a literal and a figurative sense. And the other way to say it is an agency narrative when God assigns someone a mission, when they become an agent. Now, I'm going to run through these examples so uh, relatively quickly so we could get to back to the Yosef story. But consider Abraham. Right, Abraham bursts upon the scene. Yeah, there's a tiny bit about Abraham at the end of Parsha Noah in chapter 11 of Sefer Bereshit. But Abraham bursts upon the scene in Parsha Lech Lecha in chapter 12. And I will make you into a great nation after you leave your native land, your 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 father's house. And you will be a blessing, may ye bracha, and all who bless you will be blessed, and those who curse you will be cursed. And Abraham went as God commanded him, and Lot went with him. And how old was Abraham when God called to him? And Abraham responded, Abraham ben chamesh shanim b'shivim shana b'tzeto mecharan. He was age 75. And he lives to 175. Now, the Torah tells us precious little about his first 75 years, which I think we could agree something formative must have happened during those first 75 years. Where did he go to college? Where, what yeshiva did he study at in his gap year? You know, something formative had to, had, had to happen. Um, but the Midrash fills in that gap, as many of us know, uh, and the Rambam then coalesces all of those different Midrashim into a, a consistent narrative. And the Rambam in Hilchot Avodah Zarah and the Mishnah Torah, I'm going to just summarize it, it actually draws a fantastic uh, developmental sequence for Abraham's growth. He says at three, he started questioning matters theological and started thinking about God. At 40, 37 years later, he came to the conclusion that God exists. And then at age 75, 35 years after he was convinced that God exists, God calls to him. That's a, a, a lot of time for, for development. I don't mean to diminish it in any way, right? Uh, Halabai, we should have the, the faith of Abraham Avinu. But th there's a lot there before age 75 when he hears God calling to him. Yosef, presumably comes into his greatness before 75 years of age. Well, what other examples do we have? So some of us know the story of Shimshon and Sefer Shoftim. And when Shimshon, is, when his birth is heralded to Eshet Manoach, his mother, whose name we don't even know, not least in the Pshat, in the text itself, the angel that visits her in that chapter 13 of Sefer Shoftim, tells her that she's supposed to treat Shimshon as a Nazir from in utero. No wine when he's born, no razor shall come upon his head. And then the angel reveals to her that he will begin to save Israel from the hands of the Philistines. But what's curious for those of you who have ever studied Sefer Shoftim is that Eshem Anoach never reveals that information to her husband. At least we don't have evidence that she revealed it to her husband. And it's not even clear that she ever revealed it to Shimsho. There, We know that he is full of his strength and that God's anger burns in his muscles and in the works of his hands. But there is no I self-reflection or self-identification that he is Moshe Yisrael. He he functions 
in a strange way as a Moshe Yisrael, but he doesn't gather the people. He doesn't marshal the troops. He doesn't bring unity to the people of Israel or 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 or, or bring them back from their 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 um, uh, sin. He just takes care of things himself. So it's it's unclear in what ways Shimshon realized his greatness. He realized his strength, his might, his capacity to inflict damage. But did he realize his role? I leave that as an open question. It's not our topic for today. What about Yirmiyahu Hanavi? Yirmiyahu Hanavi, God says in the first chapter, which is Yirmiyahu's call narrative, Beterem et Sarcha, before I fashioned you, Babetan, in your mother's womb, Yedatiha, I knew you. And before you were uh, born, I sanctified you. A prophet for the nations, I have placed you. And God said to me, Don't claim that you're not worthy. Don't claim that you're just a lad. Ki al kol asher ashalachacha tele. For wherever I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. I place the word in your mouth. So Yirmiyahu is told by God that God had this plan for him even before he was born. But how old is Yirmiyahu when he is told this? When he is told, not realizes for himself, but he is told that he's destined for greatness. In fact, he doesn't realize it because he says, I'm a na'ar. I'm too young. I'm too inexperienced. I, I don't have the capacities. I'm not worthy. Well, there's a wonderful Abarbanel who quotes the Rambam, who says you could only be a prophet after your experience and your achievement in learning and in midot and ethical excellence and in avodat Hashem and spiritual discipline. And the Abarbanel pushes back and says that Yirmiyahu was very young when God calls him to be a Navi. He, he speculates he was 12 or 15 years old. And he creates that construction. And so it is possible that someone could realize they're destined for greatness, certainly if God whispers it in your ear from a young age. We see that explicitly as we take our survey of, of figures who are called to greatness in Shmuel Hanavi. Banar Shmuel, Mishareta Tashem Lipne Eli. Shmuel is certainly a lad after Hannah brings him to the Beit HaMikdash to serve Eli, and God calls to him. And, and he, he, he has no experience, he has no awareness, he has no understanding. He hears Shmuel, Shmuel, and he runs to Eli, if you remember, and says, Hineni, I'm here. And Shmuel finally realizes it's God's calling to him. He doesn't get it, so he's young. So you could be destined for greatness even from a young age. And in fact, he's not a Nabi, but at the end of Sefer Malachim Bet, Yoshiahu, Hamelech, King Josiah, at least according to the version in Divrei Hayamim, says he was eight years old when he was made king. And eight years to his reign, so he's 16 years old, starts as a king at age eight, and becomes a, 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 eight years later. And he's still a lad, he's still a young man, still an adolescent. Hechel Lidrosh. He had a spiritual awakening. He had a religious revival. He began to seek after the God of David, his father, after the horribly idolatrous and evil reigns of his father and grandfather, his father Amon and his grandfather Menashe. So it is possible to have a sense of agency, of divine mission, of sacred purpose, of a calling to mission and greatness when one is in one's younger years. Whether one be a prophet or a political leader, 
it is possible. We have those precedents in the Tanakh. Now you might say they're not precedents, they're antecedents. They come after Yosef. I would agree with you. But I'm 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 just trying to show that it's not impossible. So between his birth and his revealing himself to his brothers at age, what is he, like 39 when he reveals himself to his brothers? At one point does he realize that he has sacred purpose? And we look can look at the other court prophets, by the way. Yosef is what we call a, um, an exilic courtier, right? He's a he's in a foreign ruler's court outside the land of Israel. We have two other figures like that in Tanakh. One is Daniel, and the other is Esther Hamalka, right? They all and and by the way, the language between Esther, Daniel, and the Yosef story, the Rishonim in their commentaries on these parshiot that we're studying in Breshit, all find parallels between the language of Daniel and the language of, of Megillat Esther. The, the three biblical figures have a, a lot in, in common. And we all know the, the famous words when Esther is so passive for the first four prakim, she doesn't realize her own greatness. And then Mordechai has to remind her Mordechai has to remind her that um, that got malchut. Who knows if you ascended to the royal throne, if you became the queen, just for this moment? And she's a naara. That's the phrase used in the in the Tanakh. She's young. And what does she do when Mordechai challenges her with that? She starts giving orders. And Esther transform an inflection point, a reflection point. She transformed from a passive figure to an active redeemer who saves the Jewish people. So let's get back to Yosef. When did Yosef realize he had a greater destiny? So I put together a, a menu of options. Right, I'm calling this in median rest. We're trying to medius rest. We're trying to find in the middle of the story when he realizes this. Right. So option number one was from birth, and we saw a midrashic tradition that says that Yaakov Abinu challenges Lavan and say it's time for me to leave because he knew that with the birth of Yosef he could challenge Asa. But that's still even from that that doesn't tell us Yosef knew it and doesn't give us a sense that uh, Yosef is destined for the role that he's going to play. That's part of the Yaakov story, his drama with Asa, not the role that Yosef is going to play with his brothers and in Egypt. And then we went to the end and we said when he reveals himself, but what about in the middle? Can we identify other points when Yosef may have realized his greatness? What about when his father gives him the coat of many colors? What about during his youth? In last week's Parsha, when he dreams, his dreams, the sheaves of wheat, bowing down to his sheaf of wheat, the stars, the 11 stars, the sun and the moon bowing down to his star. What about when he was in the pit that we referenced earlier and the snakes and scorpions, at least in the Midrash, don't bite him, certainly in the Pshat, that he's just in a pit about to be sold. What about in Beit Potiphar, when he sees great success? What about in prison? When he also sees great success and he becomes a dream interpreter. What about when he interprets Paro, Paro's dreams? He becomes Paro's viceroy. He, Paro's dreams come true and he is successful. Does he realize that he's destined for greatness then? And even if he realizes he's destined for greatness, does he realize his role yet that he has to play? What about when his brothers come? What about when he sees his little brother, Benjamin, and once again, he chokes up and is overcome with emotion? What about when he tests his brothers to see if he could plant the seeds of jealousy in real time and watch them germinate by giving double portions to Benjamin at a meal? Or having them see if they'll take responsibility for each other, and the brothers do tshuva. And he hears them say, it's because of how we treated our brother Yosef that God has created these problems for us. Is that when he sees a greater role for himself? Or maybe he doesn't realize the role he has to play until 
immediately after he reveals himself. And like a light bulb going off, it all just kind of clicks for him. The pieces were there, but they didn't come together. Or is there some even deeper understanding when he goes back to bury his father and he passes by the pit and he sees where it all began and how it all unfolded, knowing that he has to go back to Egypt and he'll likely live out the rest of his life there. So in this menu, can we identify when he realized his greatness? So let me uh, show you some that we're not the only ones to ask this question. Uh, I don't think anyone's framed it precisely the same way as I'm framing it now. I don't mean to say that I'm having a novel approach to it. I'm just saying that's not how the Meforshim work. They don't write essays, uh, holistic essays like, like modern Bible scholars do. But, but uh, let's take a look at not when he was born, but when his father favors him and gives him a coat of many colors. So what are we to make of ketonet pasim? First of all, how to translate that phrase is very difficult. On Al HaTorah, where I called many of these sources, if you don't know alhatorah.org, I recommend that you get to know it. It's uh, It borrows from Safari and it creates a online mikra ot gadola, rabbinic Bible. But this is the footnote. As the phrase appears only here and in Shmuel, the meaning pasim is debated, though from context, it appears to be a royal garment. Many related to the Aramaic pas, which refers to a palm, thus Breshit Rabbah suggests a long sleeve tunic reaching the palm. While Shadal and Rabbi David Svi Hoffman say a cloak which reached the ankle, noting that this was a sign of grandeur, flowing robes. Alternatively, Ibn Ezra says it means embroidered, rich royal robes, or multicolored, the Septuagint and Radak and Rabbi Abram ben Harambam. Alternatively, the word refers to the material of which the cloak was made, fine wool. Regardless of its exact meaning, Sforno says, why did Yos Yaakov give Yosef ketonet pasim? Laot as a sign, as a symbol, as a vote of confidence. Shehu hamanhig babayetu basadeh that he is going to be the family leader. Uh, in in Yeshaya Novi, and, and he he garbed him in your mantle, so to speak, in, in your in your cloak. Or as our sages of blessed memory say, uh, that uh, authority uh, is signaled by the attire worn by the people possessing it. Right? We sometimes say, right, don't look at the, 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 the book's cover, read the inside of the book, don't look at the can, look what's inside. Other times we say, no, what we wear, the clothes makes the person. Give people royal garment, a hat that says, follow the leader, they'll rise to leadership. So we still don't know if Yosef realizes the role that he has to play, but at least there is license to interpret that Yo Yaakov saw something in him from the very beginning that he was destined for, for, for leadership. We're also told, by the way, that he is um, Ben Zikuni, Hulo, that he was the child of Yo Yaakov's older years. And that's why he loved him. And Yisrael loved Yosef more than all his sons because he was a son of his old age and he made him a coat of many color colors. So some say, right, just very simply, he was the son of his beloved wife, Rachel. He was the baby of the family and he doted on him. But Rashi cites Unkelis based on the Breshi Rabbah that says, no, Yaakov taught Yosef all that he learned from the tradition of the patriarchs, all that he learned in the language of Chazal from the yeshiva of Shem and Eber, Shem being the grandson of Adam Harishon, Eber being Shem's grandson. And, um, and uh, 
and 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 so we have this tradition that Yaakov saw in Yosef greatness. And if you train someone for greatness, does he see that role? He may not know the precise role, but he's being groomed for it. Now, if you remember, he has these dreams and he tells the brothers the dreams. That was in last week's parasha. And the Torah tells us that the brothers were jealous of him. But his father made a mental note. He took note of it. He remembered the, the matter. He remembered the matter. So um, Rashi and Sforno and others say that he remembered it because he wanted to see it come true. He had confidence in his son Yosef. This still doesn't tell us whether Yosef realized it for himself, but Yaakov saw it in the person. When I read that, I, I think of, for those of us who have had the blessing to be parents when our children are young, sometimes you have a vision of the little man or the little woman and the little child. You know, they say something, Peter naturally uh, uh, sophisticated or prescient or precocious, and you kind of see the the person you think they may grow up into, whether they grow up into that person or not. Babi Shamar Tavdavar, he remembered uh, the matter. Um, but again, others say that he remembered the, the matter because Yaakov was grooming him for a role. He was grooming him for a role. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's why he filed the matter mentally. That still doesn't tell us. Yosef has these dreams. That would be enough to at least bo boost his confidence and give him a, a sense of greatness, but not precisely what the mission is. So we'll leave that as a piece. We already spoke about the pit. What about in Beit Potiphar? So he kind of realizes in Beit Potiphar that he's a, a, man, a young man of capacity. He has organizational skills. People listen to him. He has charisma. By Yish Matzliach, he is a successful man. That's what the Torah calls him. And we know that he also still has a moral conscience. He, he, he won't sleep with Eshet Potiphar. He also has a sense that he has capacities. Is that destined for greatness? And does he realize his agency? I still ask that. In, in prison, he sees himself as a dream interpreter. But even before that, by he Hashem at Yosef, by Yete Lab Chesed. When Yosef was in prison, which is not a friendly place, Hashem was with him and extended kindness to him, gave him favor in the eyes of the chief jailer. And then when people, uh, uh, what did the chief jailer do? The chief jailer relied on him because he saw anything that Yosef did, God made successful. And then he becomes a dream interpreter to the butler and the baker, to the Sar Hamashkin, the chief cupbearer. And uh, he uh, he references how he was taken into slavery, that he's innocent, that they he did nothing that he should have been put into the pit, the pit being here, the prison, not the pit that his brothers put him in, even though there's the, the resonance there. And uh, what's interesting is that even though he credits God for the the ability to interpret the dreams that that God has the 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 dream interpretations, and that's where he 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 gets it from, uh, because he relies on the butler to get him out, the Sar Hamashkim to get him out, the chief cupbearer to get him out, the midrashic tradition is actually critical of him. Uh, that he placed his trust in and says that he was in jail for, for two more years. What about when he's Paro's viceroy? He's described in the Torah. He says to Paro, this is the interpretation of your dream, seven years of famine, seven years of plenty, plenty. And not only that, I know you asked me only to interpret the dream, but I'm going to go into consulting mode and tell you what to do about it, how to fix the situation. So he said, appoint ish nabon b'chacham a man who is understanding and wise. And then he tells them exactly about the store cities and how to plan for famine. 
Vayomer Paro el Abadab. So Paro says to his servants, Haning Sakazet Isha Sheruach Elohim Bo. Can we find someone like this young man in whom the Spirit of God is? Vayomer Paro el Yosef, Achrei Hodi Elohim Otcha et Kolzot Ein Navon Bechacham Kamocha. Now that God, I see God has revealed this to you, there's no one who is more understanding and wise than you. And then he makes him his viceroy, the second command over all of Egypt. Yosef ben Shloshim, Shloshim Shana. Okay, so he's 30 years old, and then there's two years of famine. He's 32 years old when the, the brothers came. I said 39 before 32. I apologize about that mistake. Does he have a sense of greatness now? <laughs> I think so. I think so. He's the second in command. But does he realize the role that he's supposed to play now? For his brothers? Anyone want to argue yes? Ruth, you wanted to argue yes? If he doesn't, he, he's saving Egypt. He's saving everybody. He's like, if it, he could very easily, of course, think of himself. This is this is my destiny. This is I am living out my dreams that I had. This is what I'm supposed to. This is where I'm supposed to be. Yeah. So he had a sense of destined for greatness, but it's not clear that he has any sense that he's supposed to be the savior of his family that sold him into slavery. Yeah, but they're they have inevitably they are going to have to come to Egypt for food. So it's interesting. That is exactly what Rabbi Yosef Bechor Shor says, based on the psukim in in uh, uh, this week's parsha. Yosef saw his brothers and recognized them, but he acted as a stranger to them and spoke to them harshly. He said to them, "From where do you come? May I invite them?" And they said, "From the land of Canaan to buy food." Yosef recognized his brothers, but they didn't recognize him. And Yosef remembered, It's at that moment, the Torah says, he remembers his dreams. So that's a point of reflection and perhaps inflection. Maybe not complete inflection yet, because he doesn't know what he's going to do with them. Now, Rav Yosef Bechor Shor, like you, Ruth, takes the position because he was expecting that. Maybe they would come because of the famine, because the way of the patriarchs was come to Egypt in the face of famine. Like it says, there was famine in the land and Aram descended to Egypt. And with Yitzchak, do not go down to Egypt because he was going to go down to Egypt because there was famine in the land. So Yosef, sitting on the throne, said, I bet my brothers are going to come. Now, whether he had a plan to do what to do with them once they come, that the Torah doesn't realize. But the pshat in the Torah is, Vayiskor Yosef HaTachalamot. It's only when they come and he sees them that he starts to think about them again. So while he came into his greatness earlier, it's not clear that he knows his destiny or his agency, what role he's supposed to play. So I hear you, Ruth, and I hear Rab Yosef Bechor Shor. And I think it's a compelling read, but it's not the necessary read. It is possible that Yosef remembers the brothers, remembers the dreams, and the pieces start to come together. And Yosef remembered the dreams which he, he dreamt. The Ramban says, as opposed to Rashi, Rashi says, oh, his dreams came true. Wow. How do you like that? The dreams came true. My brothers are bowing down to me. But the Ramban says the reason Yosef then goes through all the shenanigans of accusing his brothers of stealing and all that is because the dreams didn't come true. Because only 10 brothers bowed down to him. Binyamin wasn't there. The 11th brother wasn't there. And his father didn't come down yet. And so he realized that the dreams are in the process of coming true, but he had to stage things in a way to make them come through. And only when they actually came through would his true destiny be revealed to him. There's a very long Ramban, but you could read it. He throws in there that he had to test their, their chuba also to see if they did chuba. 
But the idea that the Ramban is saying, and Ramban, Ramban we know, part of his Derech Parshanut is he sees the big picture and he creates these narrative arcs. The Ramban, uh, uh, the, the fascinating thing about the Ramban is he starts to piece it together and he basically says, in my own words, that he was getting pieces of the larger picture, but he didn't yet put them all together because it's still unfolding and he's figuring out how to deal with it, how to test it, what decision to make. Will he reveal himself? Will he not reveal himself? Will the dreams come true? Will they not come true? How can he orchestrate it so it comes true? Now, when Yosef sees Benjamin, he's overcome with emotion. And he goes to a private room. And like the other times that we pointed out, he weeps there, right? There, there also is an emotional transformation that takes place with him in his reunion with his brothers, which isn't uh, the first response. When he first sees his brothers, the Torah tells us that he spoke to them with harsh words. He spoke to them harshly. Now, some of the Mephoshim say that was all a ruse. It was a pretense. It was to go through the stages that he need to happen. But on another level, he may not know where he wants to take this. Will he reveal himself or will he say, stop, not Paneach? He'd have a perfectly good life by just selling them a little food and staying the Viceroy of Egypt with his wonderful Egyptian wife and their two kids. So there's an emotional development that happens there. And then his brothers do chuba, partly or in major part because of how he tests them with the jailing of Shimon and then the the the, the potential jailing of Binyamin and then the, the meal where he gives Binyamin double portions. And when Yehuda and Parshat Vayigash comes forward and says, I'm a surety for my brothers, right? That also changes Yosef. So when does Yosef realize that he had a greater destiny? I, and think, I, there's, I think there's a two, yeah. different, two different things going on. When he, If he realizes he has a greater spiritual destiny or a greater secular administrative destiny, and I don't know where they happen at the same time. Excellent observation. And that's why we're on the same wavelength. I expand the question now that we're coming to the end. Not only when did when did Yosef realize that he had a greater destiny or that he was a person of great capacities, but when did he realize that he was a shaliach Hashem, an agent of God for the particular purpose of providing refuge and salvation for his family? And it could be, as Eric pointed out, that those are two different tracks that ultimately coalesce, but only as the whole story envelops. So we certainly know when he realizes his 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 destiny. After he reveals himself to his brothers, there's a light bulb that goes off. And then we work our ways backwards and we can find right moments of reflection, moments of discovery, but no certain uh, you know, evidence that he had the grand plan in his mind at any one stage. And that he recognized perhaps his capacities for greatness early on. And it could be that others realized his capacity for greatness even before he realized his capacity for greatness. But when did he realize, like you said, Eric, that he was a shliach Hashem, that he was there to save his brothers, to provide refuge? I didn't even ask the question of when does he realize he might be enacting the promise that God told to Abraham at the brief Ben Habitarim, that your children will descend into Egypt and become slaves. That, that I didn't even engage that question. So I'd like to conclude in the following way. I want to get back to this idea of reflection points and inflection points. There's a pasuk in Tehillim at the end of Kapitel Kuv Zayin, Perk 107. Mi chacham vayishmor ele, who is wise? 
let him observe these things. The whole psalm is about expressing gratitude to God for the miracles in the national history of the Jewish people and perhaps in our personal lives. Who is wise? Let him observe these things. Vayit bonenu chazdei Hashem. And let them consider the kindnesses of Hashem. Let them reflect on the kindnesses, the miracles that are with us each day of God's kindnesses. Let's reflect on that. So the 19th century Italian Mefaresh, Rabbi Yitzchak, Moshe Yitzchak Ashkenazi, known as the Holil Moshe, I thought this was really interesting, writes on this Pasuk, Vayishmor, Mi chacham beishmor who is wise and will guard, keep, remember, observe these things. Vayishmor is an allusion from the same language of the Aviv and his father Jacob, Shamar et Hadavar, saw the seeds of greatness in his son and filed them away. And he saw that the other brothers were je jealous, which is why he sent Yosef on a mundane er uh, 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 errand to check on the welfare of his brothers. Like a servant to, to see how they're doing. He downgraded Yosef and put him in the role of a servant so he could perhaps mitigate some of the jealousy that they held. But in his heart, right, he he uh, he reflected upon it. He remembered it. So, my dear friends, uh, one of the fascinating things about studying the Yosef story and entertaining these two questions of when did Yosef realize his capacities for greatness and the second question of when did he realize his agency, his sacred purpose, his divine mission to seek after his brothers, to provide refuge and sustenance, to be a savior, sustainer, redeemer, a hand of God. In thinking about that, uh, we come to the challenge in our own lives of how do we engage in a reflective process at different points in our own life course, that hopefully will trigger, inf trigger inflection points where we then assume what we perceive to be as a positive role, mission, sense of divine agency, sense of purpose, whether it be in our lives, in our families' lives, in our community for the Jewish people, a contribution to greater society. We learn from the Yosef story that there may not be one moment when, uh, like uh, at the very beginning, when it all comes together, if we're a Navi and Hashem whispers on our air, hey, guess what? I'm choosing you for this purpose, then it does come together. But in Yosef's case, right, he recognized his capacities, he tested them, he tried them, he improved upon them, he realized his talents, his ability to contribute something. And then as the pieces fall into place, he realizes that he has a greater mission to play. At one point, it becomes explicit and he articulates it and he shares it with his brothers and all of the other drama and dynamics melt away because he realizes this is why it all unfolded. But at what point we realize it is an open question. That's part of the human... Uh, experience, experiment, uh, predicament. But what is beautiful about the Midrash with which I began is when Yosef traveled back all those years later and passed by the pit that his brothers threw him in. He didn't see a, a, a den of torture and a symbol of betrayal and the trigger of his trauma that began it all. But he saw a starting point which unfolded in all the ways that it did that led him to play his divine role. That uh, is not easy. It holds a great deal of inspiration and it challenges us as this Pasuk in Tehillim does to be mit bonen or mit bonenet, to have reflection points and perhaps that will lead to inflection points 
so that like Yosei, we can realize our capacities and perhaps even alight upon the sacred purpose and the mission that we have to play in all of the different circles of our relationships and connection. Okay, uh, we are out of time. I'm happy to stay on if people have comments or questions, but we're out of time. So I, I realize that <laughs> people will have to go. But if you want to stay on and talk, I'm here for you. Thank Otherwise, you. happy Hanukkah and Shabbat Shalom. Any questions, Bakasha? Ruth, you want to say something? You can unshare your screen, Rabbi. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Any questions, comments? Otherwise, thank you. Very uh, interesting. Uh, as usual, the Torah doesn't answer many of the questions we might like answered, I guess we can say, which, of course, is the point for us to think about it, various answers, how they all might apply. But, um, okay. I, yes, I have a question. Earlier in your talk, you talked about that the miracle of the oil was the highlight or the key and uh, everything else stemmed from that. I view it differently. The fact that the military victory is what led to the to to the miracle of the oil that God helps those who help themselves first, and that was the key thing that they went out and did something for themselves. And the other is just the cherry on top that you can yeah. that you, that is you can have but not necessary, or you create it out of thin ice or air or nothingness. If you want to do a theological. A lesson that may or may not actually exist. So Ben, I, I agree with you completely. And I was citing the Mesha Chokman. I think he would agree with you. Uh, you know, what, what he was saying is that we celebrate miracles that are supernatural because they then reveal the, the hidden meanings behind the natural activities. So you, you, you are correct in saying and, that. And to put it into modern terms, it's the Israeli military, which is the key thing, which allows for the learning. It's not the learning which allows for the military to be successful. And yeah. so one is dependent on the other, uh, and one isn't dependent on the other. Well, uh, you know, I, I, I hear that. I, I, I would uh, frame it slightly differently, but that's okay. If we have a, a different formulation, I would say that but as uh, Rabbi Jay knows, I'm not a nice person, so I say things do agree. No, uh, no, no, that's okay, Ben. It's okay. We it, this makes for a richer conversation. I would say that ein somchin al hanes. We don't wait around for miracles to happen. We have our hishtadlut. Do your best, and God will do the rest, uh, as my Rebbe used to say in his little maxim. And um, and we need a society. <clears throat> that has an Israeli defense force, as well as that has institutions of higher learning, and especially for Torah learning, which undergirds the whole of the ethics of what it means to be a Jewish state, and that there are many ways that people contribute to the larger whole. But what I think the Meshech Chachma was saying is the reason on Hanukkah we celebrate the miracle of the oil is not to displace the uh, the the military miracle or the miracle of self sovereignty the opposite he wants to celebrate those miracles it's just that the radiance of the candles illumines the larger spiritual framework of that military victory and of that political self sovereignty rabbi yes please hey lynn no oh, my good friend dr lynn heller yes so I wanted to comment that the Torah weighs in right away. In chapter 37, Ela Toldot Yaakov, you're safe. What happened to the brothers? Are they chopped liver? No, it's immediately <laughs> the tie between Jacob and Joseph. Right then he's chosen. And I think we also have to consider, but this is a topic for another discussion, of the role and power of the weeping when he weeps. Yeah, the tears of the is a great the tears and, of the and, it's, and it and it marks a quarrel within Joseph about who he is and who he's called to be. And I think it's very, very telling when he weeps and how he weeps. 
I have a contrary view of the miracle. And the miracle, the miracle is that uh, we forget the actual facts of what was going on uh, uh, of the, uh, uh, and of uh, the nature of the uh, uh, of the of uh, the Has- Hasmoneans, and we uh, say, "Oh, there!" Uh, and we add this miracle of a light that covers up the fact they celebrated Sukkot out of time, and that they made the king and the high priest the same person, and that continued for over two hundred years. There are theories that say that Chazal underplay the the military victory and the rebellion, either to not offend the Roman sensibilities, which hated rebellion and any smell of rebellion, or to emphasize that power corrupts. And when the Hasmoneans had victory and took the throne for themselves and had no checks and balances in the structure of uh, of power and and service and went against the torah and assuming the the throne in a more permanent way because they were kohanim that uh, it corrupted and and therefore chazal redefined the holiday away from a a military victory um the sukkah thing is a different topic for a different time of uh, the wonderful connections between hanukkah and sukkah both historically and thematically but uh yeah, yeah. Svi Berman, my dear friend from a long time ago. How are you, Svi? Uh, Benji, how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, can I uh, suggest two uh, two possible answers to your textual question? And when is the pivotal moment in the Yosef narrative? Uh, one possibility, right, just a suggestion, could be that... Um, uh, I'll just I'll side back to the I think the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah and also in Ketuba quote asks what actually happened on Rosh Hashanah, and it quotes I think four cases of um, Rivka, uh, Rachel, and it answered got answered Hannah, and the fourth is Yosef, uh, uh, right? He he came out of prison. Out of jail. Right. So the Yosef is strange because we obviously don't mention Yosef on Rosh Hashanah. And uh, so, Sar- sorry, Sarah was the first one. Right. And the so the all others are mentioned on Rosh Hashanah and Yosef is not. Uh, so in some ways, perhaps that actually does speak to the, you know, the text somewhat makes uh, a comment on the uh, on the narrative. But the word is not Pakad. It's, you know, it's a, the, the Shorosh Zahor so that. Gemara really didn't have to mention it, but it does mention it. And I think what connects all of those four cases is that there, there is a specific, you know, it, it, it points out that there's a pivotal moment in the narrative when there's a sort of the, the, the high, um, you know, a highlight or, you know, whatever you would want to call that um, high point in the narrative when there is a r- radical change happening. So if you, with that in mind, if you look at the text, and I think you did that allude to this, uh, in some ways, that the until the moment until Yosef comes out of the prison, he actually talks in the, really all of the words that uh, the, the text attributes to Yosef are in the first person, and he really talks about himself. Even if he talks about God, it's about what the God did for me, right? Yeah. Everything that happens after that point, Yosef talks in terms of this was God's plan. And, you know, for the sake of time, I'm not going to quote any of them, but that's, there is a, actually, I think there's a radical shift in the narrative in that particular point, point when he comes out of prison. And I, and that may be what the Gemara actually points out, that, that there is, um, you know, there's like a textual shift. That's great. I want to think about that some more and 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 run it through the narrative. But I, I love that. Uh, and it also aligns Ben, ben Meleth with what you said, because common speed to all of those cases of God remembering. What does it mean God remembers? God forgets? What does it mean God remembers? So God remembers when people remember themselves. When B'nai Israel call out to God, that's when <laughs> Sefer Shmo tells us that God remembers them. When Rivka and Chana and, uh, re, re, you know, call out to Hashem in prayer, that's when Hashem remembers them. 
And uh, it doesn't say that Yosef calls out in prayer, but maybe that's the why Chazal grouped them all together to imply that. Uh, Lynn, what you said before, I wanted to comment also. Um, you know, of course, we all know the, the literary term, the omniscient reader. That means that we as the readers uh, are privy to Hashem's revelation of the whole of the story even more than the individual participants know. Like when you're watching a movie and someone's walking down a dark alley and we know that there's someone waiting behind the corner. Well, the person in the movie doesn't know. So we know from the very first sentence, as you said, Hela told us Yaakov, Yosef, Yosef's the, the key figure. This is a story about, about him and how he's going to unfold. But my question was, when does Yosef figure out that? Because Yosef didn't get to read his whole story. There was no spoiler alert. He had to live it in real time. <laughs> if you don't mind, so I'm actually going to just the second that point, then the I think that my first point was at uh, what point does Yosef realize that God runs the world and acknowledges that that perhaps was the moment when he leaves the prison. The point when he, the way you asked for it, and I actually love the way you asked the question, when he realizes his role in that plan, uh, a possibility I just want to throw on the table would be when he names his second second child Ephraim that actually Ephraim is I think is named in memory of his mother Rachel because the Rachel dies she yes. didn't finish her job yes. she didn't finish her role and she dies on the road to something on the road to Ephrata and uh Yosef names his second son, not first, but second son, the one that, that Rachel didn't get to see, Ephraim, certainly looks like that's what, you know, that completes the Rachel role cycle. And then that point, he sees his role as actually um, creating that's the... Beautiful. It. That's That's very beautiful, Tzvi, very beautiful. Uh, Rob J., uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to study with this wonderful collection of uh, people from all different places, uh, wonderful uh, comments, uh, and um, I wish you all a happy Hanukkah, a good Shabbos. May we share Soro Tovo Yeshuot Benechamot, good tidings, uh, good reports from Israel, please God, and not the opposite of uh, Yeshuot, of uh, salvation and success and nechamot and words of consolation for the, the deep sadness that we all carry with us. May the light of Hanukkah bring hope and warmth and illumination, and I wish you all good things. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rabbi Benji. Thank, thank you. We look forward to learning with you, and uh, thank you for staying on and uh, going through all the questions. Really a, a pleasure, and uh, amen, of course, to what uh, you're saying. And, uh, okay, we look uh, forward to future occasions. Uh, thank you. And of thank course... You. Uh, my share tomorrow at 9.15 on the Siddur, which we will be doing on Hanukkah, this last day of Hanukkah. We have a few things to, to finish up that hopefully uh, our speakers haven't said over the course of the weeks. Um, um, and then next week, of course, we'll begin, as we always do, with uh, Rabbi Liebtag at 11.15 a.m. Eastern Time on Sunday. I want to wish everybody Laila Tov, Shabbat Shalom. Enjoy the last day of Hanukkah. If you haven't had enough latkes or, or sukkaniyot, there's an, and one more day to get in all the, the dentist club and the diet club uh, lobby to, you know, have all these extra foods. But anyways, we should hear good news. And uh, we were talking last week for a bench, you know, as opposed to just means uh, at this time, at this time, in this season, by of course, means miracles then and now. It's a very different thing, adding that one vav to the bracha, but that's what we should uh, merit that. Uh, but you have just like by Hanukkah, we should have Bismanazeh. Now, of course, uh, Israel's fighting uh, very, uh, very crucial war, of course, as we all know. And, uh, like you say, we should hear good news and want to wish everybody light of tov. And uh, Shabbat Shalom. Be well, everybody. Okay, we'll hope to see you soon. Thank Shabbat you. Shalom.